Yeah. Skyler Lockpicker. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Um, so, so as to make use of all of the time that I have available to me, I'm going to go ahead, but occasionally you might see the stupid thing pop up on the screen, and I apologize about that. Um, so, this is Unlucky in Locks. The whole idea of this presentation is that I want to put forward a bunch of interesting locks that you've probably never heard of. Um, and at the end, I'll talk about an interesting project that I'm working on. Um, the idea all the way around is that these are manufacturers or concepts or whatever else that for the most part no longer exist anymore. Um, thank you. Awesome. Um, that no longer exist anymore for one reason or another um, that isn't actually attributable to luck, of course. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on with all of them. So, I'm Skylar Town. Uh, uh, so you can find pretty much everything that I do at lock.gd. Um, I pronounce it lockgod. Uh, you can pronounce it however you like. Uh, it's also my personal URL shortener, um, but I just have to pass it through to my stuff now. I've also recently been named a research scholar at the Ronan Institute. They are a nonprofit that provides institutional support to academics who might not have traditional institutional support. Um, so people doing independent research that their own institutions, or in my case, uh, I have never had an institution, um, so I'm pretty excited to have some sort of backing for some of the more interesting work that I do these days. Big fan of Ronan Institute, roninstitute.org. Uh, I'm also at Shoebox on Twitter, and in general, just Skylar Town on the internet. Uh, there is one of me as best I can tell. So, we're going to talk about some walks and some keys, we're going to have some fun. Um, this, right off the bat, I actually can't remember the name of this lock. Um, I found out about this at a conference in Holland a couple of years ago. Uh, a great guy named Peter Field giving a really fascinating talk about all sorts of mechanical security. He's one of the uh, uh, director level folks at Medico. Um, really interesting guy. He's the line of the security industry. And this is what he's got to me. So what's going on here in this patent is that we have your normal pin tumbler lock with just a normal flat uh, top of the key pin, bottom of the driver pin. And over here, we have the whole concept of this patent. There's a little cup on the inside of the key pin, and there's the corresponding um, you know, concave portion in the driver pin. They have to sync up to one another and then slide out of position. Uh, and this just makes it a little more confusing to pick, adds some interesting variability to the, to the lock. Um, the concept, again, really simple. Here are your driver pins. Here are your key pins. They meet in one another, and it makes it more difficult to make, more difficult to feel your way through it. Uh, however, the patent also gives specifications for master keying. Uh, now, specifications for master keying are great, and it makes it much more extensible, and it opens up to a much wider market as far as the um, business of this company is concerned. However, in practice, the very small master wafers that have to be in this cup and ball positioning occasionally get inverted uh, through regular use because they're small enough that they can actually rotate freely um, with enough like forcing and repeated use of the key, getting bounced around inside and so on and so forth. Um, so they're affecting the summer actually just becoming inverted, leaving nice like big gaps and places where you could uh, much more easily manipulate them. And then even worse, um, actually just getting into situations where they were becoming in such a confounded and twisted position that they were breaking the lock um, and making it no longer useful for the normal key. Um, I'm lucky. So that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. This one, you'll probably at least have heard of the primary company here, Medico. Um, at one point in time, they got into a legal fight with Mhart. I'm going to explain both technologies here. Mhart was pretty awesome, and they no longer exist anymore, and we'll explain what happened. Don't worry about all of this text. The important thing is that Lois Lane and Superman are in a fight. So medical locks. Uh, the keys are cut to angles. The pins have chiseled tips so that as you insert the key into the lock, the tip of the key pin will actually orient itself to the different angles as we go along. They have large gashes cut out of the side of them that a sidebar can drop into, and we'll put this all together into uh, one image uh, provided to me by a guy who goes by the handle JK the CJ or John King, who's done some really awesome work attacking Medico. So, here are the angled cuts of our key, here's our chisel tipped pin, and we can also see the channel cut into the side of the pin. This is very important because the teeth of the sidebar are actually going to marry directly into that. Here we see them oriented in different directions. With the proper key inserted into the lock, they're all oriented in exactly the same way. So to pick this, you have to both lift and rotate the pins. It adds another dimension of the security and makes it much more difficult to open. 
M harp also has angles cut into the keys, but rather than a channel cut down the side of the key pin, their pins interlock with one another. It's actually a dovetail joint between the key pin and the driver pin. Now, this is particularly cool for a couple of reasons we'll get into, but just mechanically, it's a really beautiful idea. This is with the incorrect key inserted into the lock. Some of them are rotated out of position so they couldn't separate from each other even if they were at the right position on the shear line. Um, this one is at the right position on the shear line and rotated correctly. This one is rotated correctly but at the wrong position, so it also couldn't separate. With the correct key inserted, they are all aligned in the right direction and they can travel in a channel cut into the plug of the lock where it can rotate freely. So, Medico, uh, the security elements are differentiated. What I mean by that is that the sidebar mechanism is its own physical idea, its own, in its own physical space, and then you have the shear line that you also have to deal with setting the pins to the correct heights. So because they're differentiated, because they're not actually part of the same movement, we can break that down and attack only one of those elements at a time. Now the reason that you can pick a lock whatsoever is because of a ton of small differences in the various components of that lock. So one pin will bind before another pin because it's slightly ovoid, or this pin chamber isn't perfectly deburred, or whatever the case may be. That's why you can pick a lock, because we can deal with one pin at a time because of all these mechanical imperfections. Take that a step further, and we have a differentiated um, series of security elements inside of the lock. When we apply tension to the cylinder, we will either bind the sidebar first, or we will bind the shear line first. And what this means is that we can lift everything to the proper height and get the shear line completely settled, and then we'll actually get a rotation out of the plug, lock that sidebar into the sides of the pins, and then deal with rotating the pins. So we can take it one thing at a time, really break down our attack, and we'll deal with one element at a time. However, in the m heart, these are actually two integrated security elements. Because of that dovetail joint, you have to both lift and rotate the pin to the right position in order to have it open, uh, in order to have it turn whatsoever. You have to do both at once. You have to do both at once. You have to lift and rotate. This makes it dramatically more secure than the basic Medeco. Now, these days and, uh, and for quite a while now, Medeco has had a, what's called a driverless cam lock. And in the driverless cam lock, there are no driver pins whatsoever. It's the driverless. It has only key pins, and rather than having a solid channel in those key pins, there are holes drilled at different heights. With that, you have to both lift and rotate perfectly. It's an integrated, uh, two integrated security systems. So Medico actually has a great solution to this these days, and it's a great lock. They've done some interesting things. But at the time, MR was really swinging for the fences, coming up with something really cool, but because of that rotational element, because that exists whatsoever, Medico went out and sued their pants off. So, um, even at the time, there uh, is a good book on, um, there's a good book the, just describing all of the means for securing physical properties, uh, and it describes Medico and Emhart as part of the same class, but then goes into another few sentences of depth on what I've described here, saying how difficult it is to even perform the basic operations of manipulation on the Emhart versus the Medico. So, uh, Medico sued, they get royalties, and eventually Emhart had to roll up their uh, manufacturing altogether. Um, every lock that MR produced for a long period of time, they were feeding royalties back out to Medico for, and eventually um, Corbin uh, just rolled up the MR security line altogether, so these just don't exist anymore whatsoever. Um, if you find them, get your hands on them, it's one of the coolest high security American locks that no longer exists whatsoever. Um, but, uh, that's Medico, that's MR. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> So, uh, similarly, Quickset versus Schlage, this is another situation where um, uh, there being enough imitation led to a lawsuit which rolled it up. We'll get into some other unlucky situations later, but um, these are our combatants. We have Rex the Wonder Dog and some sort of cougar. So, the Quickset Smart Key is another very interesting lock. Um, Quickset gets a lot of crap, and I get a lot of crap for being really interested in Quickset lately. Um, I was in a recent Twitter fight about this, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I... I've got these at my house. Do you? Excellent. It's about to be not to figure out how to pick them. As soon as I put any torque at all on them, everything lines up. They are significantly difficult to pick. They actually are. Um, so this guy, Walt Strader, if you look at his patent history, it goes faucet, 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 
quick set some RP. Um, he was working in the home hardware division of Black & Decker, who owned Quickset, uh, and Wiser up in Canada. Uh, and at some point in time, he was transferred to the home security team, and Quickset had been the joke of the security industry for time immemorial, as far as my time in Locksport is concerned. Um, they are like the practice lock that people suggest that you go out and pick. So Walt rolls in, and one of the first things he does is he like Googles the company. Uh, and he sees what their reputation is like on the internet, and he's, he's like, oh man, people sure are picking and bumping our locks like crazy. Let's make a new lock. That's revolutionary. That's a revolutionary idea, as ridiculous as that sounds. But I mean, you look at even companies like Multilock. Multilock iterate faster than almost anybody in the industry. An Israeli company, an Israeli high security company, and they recently came out with, uh, uh, I believe it's the Multilock X5, something like that. And it's added this tertiary locking mechanism. They have a pin in pin system, they have an interactive element on that, and now they've added a slider based system on top of all of the rest of that. It's very high security lock, very difficult to pick. Some researchers in Holland and Germany were going back and forth with the company over the course of maybe a year, maybe 18 months. Uh, this is Tool and SS Dev, for those of you that know the major groups in Europe. Uh, and Tool, of course, is represented here in America as well. Um, and they, uh, they were iterating so rapidly, they went through you know, three major revisions to the product, going back and forth with these security researchers. Even they, despite iterating so rapidly, have never thrown out their core locking concept and started something from scratch, which is what Quickset and Wall Street were doing here. Now they have a lot of inspiration. This goes back to the Rielda, the U change, the Rielda in particular, that's R-I-E-L-D-A, which was from the 70s, I guess. Never got much traction. Honestly, Rielda and, and U change are probably the really unlucky ones in this scenario. Um, you'll still see some U change installed, especially at some of the major malls across America. Um, but Quickset rolled in, did this in a really elegant way, basing it on a lot of prior work. Um, and have done a lot of good things with it, except that they made it out of terrible metal. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, here's how it works. After all that yapping. The very cool thing about the Quickset Smart Key is that each of the elements inside, the sidebar wafers and the pins, are all exactly the same as one another. So usually differentiation in the lock comes down to differences in the heights of key pins. The length of your key pin corresponds directly to the cuts in your key. The deeper the cut in your key, the longer your key pin. In this case, the differentiation comes down to where in the sidebar wafer your key pin is interlocked. So every key pin is exactly the same. Every sidebar wafer is exactly the same. It's just that this series of serrations will determine when, wherever your pin interacts with on the series of serrations will determine the height of the cut in your key. And that is the differentiation, which also allows for rekeying and on and on and on. Full stuff. Uh, this then is the sidebar, so this is now a sidebar based lock, generally, generally if you have a sidebar based lock, it's already a step up from your casual pin tumbler lock, um, and these along here, this, 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 are where these sidebar legs will fit into. So, uh, this is on the uh, interior of this carriage that is attached to the lock. These are these, the uh, serrations that your pin will swap into. This is just the other side of that same carriage with the sidebar set into its position. Now the sidebar will sit between the carriage and the plug of the lock and the housing of the lock, and that's the reason that you can't rotate this because that is sticking out, and that's to be able to press in to the plug of the lock into those gates that we were just looking at before the whole system can rotate. And now we have the pins. Again, these are all the same total height, but as they're positioned by the key, these tabs are at different positions. Those tabs then marry directly into the sidebar wafers, and that defines what sort of key will work in this. So all of this together <clears throat> is sort of in this carriage, which can be pushed offline. So when you turn the key 90 degrees, you can insert a small tool, push this entire mechanism back, It'll be held in place by a, by a detente, you remove the key, you put a new key in, and what is happening is that this, this is our pin, and this is our sidebar wafer, and this is where they're married in to begin with. When we push the carriage offline and remove the key, the pin drops down to its lowest possible level. Put a new key in, it's raised up to whatever level the cut on that new key will raise it up to. We rotate it all back, 
these lock into the lock in the new position, and you've rekeyed it. The old key will no longer work. The new key will now work indefinitely until you decide to rekey again. It's a really clever mechanism, really well implemented, really easy to rekey. Um, but that said, they made it out of pop metal. Um, they made it out of terrible materials to keep it really inexpensive. When this came out, despite being higher security for a number of things, um, this is bump proof. Uh, this is incredibly difficult to pick. Uh, Walt Strader actually sent this to Japan, which is one of the few countries in the world that actually does any sort of manipulation resistance testing um, to give grades on. It made it through two rounds of high security pick testing. Um, it is considered a high security uh, lock for that one test. Um, you also, their first line when they came out could be opened with uh, forcing by a screwdriver. Um, so again, they implemented a really clever idea into uh, really terrible materials. Masterlock recently did the same thing with their uh, speed lock, which I don't have slides of, but you can talk about it in the hallway. It's an amazing mechanism, and you can open it with security screwdrivers. So, uh, Schlage. It uh, came out with a remarkably similar product. It is rekeyable. Uh, it's similar, but not exactly the same. It's rekeyable. Um, and the main difference is that instead of having that sliding carriage, it has a pivoting carriage. So the way that they separate pin from sidebar wafer is to pivot the carriage offline instead of sliding the carriage back, at which point you can rekey it with another key. Um, the big advantage of this system is that you didn't need a, sec a separate tool to push that carriage back. You needed a different type of key. So you're always dealing with keys instead of ever dealing with a little bit of metal. Um, interestingly, though these conceptually should be bump proof, they were made so poorly that you could bump them. Um, you could bump them into the change position and then rekey somebody's lock at will. Um, a guy named Farmer Freak demonstrated this on YouTube, bumping locks very rapidly. And the reason is because while uh, well, Quickset on their sidebar wafers provided a series of serrations to make them more difficult to pick, and then also confound the bumping prods. The, again, this isn't traditional bumping, this is just that these are smooth on one side, and the sidebar is rounded, so if you just keep whacking the key until the sidebar gets close enough to the sidebar wafer, and the sidebar wafers can move freely because they're not serrated, eventually the sidebar will drop into place and it'll open freely. The sidebar locks in general probably shouldn't really be all that bumpable, uh, but Farmer Freak bumped the hell out of these. Farmer Freak also built my favorite attack of 2010 uh, against the Quickset Smart Key, where he was actually able with uh, with a, like, a scope, with a, with a powerful light and a scope, uh, he built, I don't know why I don't have a slide with this, okay, it's really simple. Uh, he took a blank for a quick set, he milled out the inside of it, and then at a 45 degree angle, uh, just before the tip of the key, which was still solid, at a 45 degree angle, he polished a mirror into the brass. He then mounted a light right here, <coughs> And as he put it into the lock, raising everything up to its highest position, he could see where the pin was interacting with the sidebar wafer. He could see where that connection was and actually just name the cuts of the key as he inserted it and visually decoded it. Um, it was stellar. Uh, guy by the handle of Valinex built a similar system uh, by uh, physically um, decoding it with a small metal flag that would count the number of uh, serrations in that sidebar wafer before you got to a pin. Um, I, I think that it lends credence to the, to the like, interesting and, and security level of lock. You have to come up with crazy attacks against it. Um, so it's totally defeated, but it's still a really cool lock. And if your mom is looking for a new lock, I suggest that you make her get the Quickset Smart Key. Hell, if you have a residential property and you don't want to put bars on the windows anyway, the defeats against this are primarily force. And they can break the window and unlock it from the inside just as easily as they can crank it around and rip it out of your lock. So it's a cool lock for its market. Anyway, Quickset sues. Um, they accuse Schlage of infringing on two parts of their specific patent, um, and they accuse them of false advertising. The false advertising is actually the part that I find most interesting. Um, Schlage explicitly claimed that their lock was 10 times more secure than any of their competitors. Um, and being that, it was, yeah, <laughs> being that it was not only based on the Quickset idea, which of course in turn was based on Rielda back in the day, but can also be bumped and have literally ignored portions of the security that Quickset paid attention to, um, it's, it's clearly a fairly fraudulent claim. Um, Schlage put out a press release standing behind its product and statements ready to vigorously defend its rights, etc., etc. Um, and of course, uh, it was off the market by December of 2011 by court order. 
um, pulled from the shelves completely, pulled off. Um, and it, in this case, Quickset is the one that uh, they want. So, uh, we're going to talk about Norman Epstein. Norman Epstein is, um, Norman Epstein was uh, a genuine mechanical genius. Uh, his lock designs are a revelation. Um, and this is a very different sort of lock. Norman was never sued out of business whatsoever. His lock designs are absolutely incredible. They were heralded as high security at their time. And yet you will find none of them in production. You will find none of them anywhere right now. All right, so uh, this is the one that went into full production that was actually installed places and was sold at trade shows and so on and so forth. It's a really cool lock. And we'll get into the interior in a minute. But I want to show you just a few of the patents of Norman Epstein's that I found with patent diving. Um, this is for a really clever, and this is, this is defeatable, but it's a really clever idea that will kind of clue you into what he's going to be doing in the rest of his career. So this is a sesame lock, and sesame locks are the ones with, you know, you all know that. Great. <clears throat> this little push button, though, is going to be important in a minute. You'll see why. So if we look inside of this, uh, so this is a side view now, and this is the, these are the, you know, guys rotating. So, Usually in a sesame lock, you'll see an inner wheel that has some sort of uh, passive sidebar or something like that. In this case, however, the actual wheel that you're manipulating has an active element. Um, and that's sea change from the normal realm of sesame locks. It's a really clever idea. So what's going on here is that each of the wheels has a toggle in it. And these have a little bit of movement available to them on either side. As they pass by each other, they just move out of each other's way because they have enough room to. However... Oh, here's the toggle. Sorry, moving in one direction or the other. There it is in place. And when we align them all, they'll all push out as much as they can, but because they're now all in alignment, it creates a longer total space than they're usually doing as they're passing around, and it is enough that they are... You actually will push up on this plunger which will shove the entire line against this spring, decoupling this locking dog from the shackle. It's really clever, and I am confident that none of you have ever seen anything like it. And if, if I am wrong about that, I want desperately to talk to you. Because um, this is one of the cooler things that I've ever seen, and it got me obsessed with Norman Epstein. So, um, this is another locking concept, uh, also utilizing ball bearings, but now we have a pin-based lock. Um, so each of the pins has sort of a spool shape. There are no drivers in this. This is once again a driverless pin tumbler lock, so these are only key pins. But each of the key pins has a spool taken out of the top of it that a ball bearing can ride in. And the ball bearing only has a limited amount of space to turn because it can't actually get into the, the fullness of the housing of each of the pins. So when the pins are misaligned, the ball bearings have enough room to move. Seeing the last one, we can probably see what's about to happen. When we insert the key, they are all now in alignment, and it is just creating the longest version of that line, which pushes against the spring. And this is the cool part, because it isn't, it isn't like in the last one where it's decoupling something. In this case, it is actually creating a coupling between the plug of the lock and the cam of the lock. Now, the cam of the lock is what will connect to the bolt or the... Uh, uh, Thing like a bolt, uh, the sprung. I'm gonna walk away from that. Okay, so, uh, but that, this is the part that does the actual unlocking. Um, and so, without the key inserted, in fact, let's go back just to demonstrate this. Without the key inserted, there's actually nothing attached to the cam. So you can do whatever you want to everything in here. You are not going to be able to hold anything at its shear line because the ball bearings will physically, the ball bearings and the springs will physically force themselves back at you. When we pick a lock, I often say that we're reproducing the action of the key one pin at a time. You cannot reproduce the action of the key one pin at a time in this. You have to reproduce every pin at the same time. This is the full integration of every single pin in the lock. Every pin in the lock is fully integrated into a single movement at the end of the key's full insertion. And picking this is, is far from trivial. I do not know of this actually being produced, actually being brought to market. I don't know a physical version of this. There might be out there. So, this piece here is what will actually interlock once the key is inserted and all of the ball bearings are 
um, at the right level, and now the whole system can turn and the cam will actually be rotated and we'll pull that bolt. So, now we get on to the actual lock that came into production. This, I believe, is from Popular Mechanics, an article about uh, the Norman lock. Uh, so it has this very cool curved key with some interestingly cut angles in it. Uh, it goes into the side there. And we've already seen Norman approach combination-based locks. We've seen him approach pin-based locks. We've seen him uh, decouple a locking dog from a shackle. We've seen him couple. Uh, we, we've seen him work with what I call cam separation, which is a really cool concept, and a lot of people do it really terribly right now, especially in electronic locks. If you ever come up to a door and you can turn the handle without anything happening, then you input your code, how you authenticate, however you do, and then the handle engages. That's cam separation. The handle, until you authenticate, is separated from the cam of the lock. You can often bypass those with a strong magnet or a soft mallet and just bridge the gap to the cam directly, avoiding the authentication altogether and open up the lock. Cam separation, we see it all the time. It's been a problem for a long time, and very few people implement it correctly. End of that particular rant. More about Norman Epstein. So, <clears throat> what's going on here is really cool. Now he's actually approaching disc container locks, so a third completely different um, locking concept that he is now applying, and it's the same, he's working with the same idea across a number of already known mechanical locking uh, uh, ideas. So in this case, the ball bearings are now being carried in these discs, as you can see right here. Now each of these, where they are positioned in each of the discs will be different, and we'll see the, the variation in this cutout in each of the discs. Each of the discs has a spacer between it. Um, and then we have the ball bearings acting as uh, just what a normal disc container would have as a sidebar. If you haven't seen a lot of disc container locks, I have a lot of information about them. You can track them down and compare it after the fact. Let it be known to you by me that this is very clever and not something that you've seen in other disc container locks. So, um, same idea, we've seen it before, as these come around into alignment, as the key rotates them all so that all the bear ball bearings line up, it pushes into here, and this bridges a gap into the cam of this lock, which would otherwise spin freely, and now the cam can turn, and, and so he's incorporated all those ideas into what is now. You'll also notice that except for this one spring in the very back of the lock, there are no other springs. Most disc container locks have no springs. They're often uh, used in the railroad industry in America. That's one of the places that you'll see them because they survive just without anything being shoved into them. Because there are no springs, they just are brutal turning bastards that will do anything that your key tells it to do and muscle their way through a lot. So, at the time it was being compared to um, the Fiché, which is this amazing French lock. Um, which had its own problem. You can sort of see here that this is in the shape of an I-beam. Now, putting a key in the shape of an I-beam makes it incredibly strong. In this case, rather than ball bearings, these guys had two brass sidebars. So if you put a bar of metal through this and tor 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 torqued over and over again, you would actually just shear those sidebars off because the key was so strong that you could overpower it with its own key. Well, with its own key over the blank keys, you usually have to go with blank key. You wouldn't do it with its own key because then it gets heavy. Unlock it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was being compared favorably against one of the highest security and foreign locks in the world by people like Popular Mechanics and other people. Um, unfortunately, the Pragmatic Lock Company, which is Norman's lock company, that's producing the locks, he always produced these independently with his own lock company. Um, they rolled up, they went out of business. They didn't contract with any of the major manufacturers, and I don't know the exact causes, but the fact that while he was producing amazing locks, the globalization of the mechanical security industry was going ahead full force, and that he continued to produce independently rather than throwing his lot in with Asa Abloy or Kavamas. Yes? Um, do you know if his IP belongs to his estate or if it's been bought off by him? Very good question. I have no idea. That's a really good question. I would love to know the answer to that. Um, so sadly, he's dead. Um, and he is very well remembered by the people in the community that knew him. I absolutely never did. Um, but on like real locksmithing forums at antiquelocks.com, which are just a bunch of awesome old codgers that know a lot about locks, more than I will ever know, and I'm gleaning as much information from them as I can as possible. Um, I mean, there are stories of him bringing a, a fishbowl full of sand 
And, and that would be his display at uh, one of the major lock smithing uh, conventions. And when somebody would come up to talk to him, he would pull his lock out of this thing of sand, shake the sand out of it, put the key in, and it would work perfectly every time. Um, just to demonstrate how like hardy it was, how strong it was. Um, so we lost a real mechanical genius, and right now his IP is linguishing, lingering. Um, yeah. What's his last name? Epstein. Norman Epstein. When did he pass away? Few years ago well, now, probably sometime between like seven and twelve years. I don't have an obituary for him. I would love to. Um, I'm obsessed with him, but I've been obsessed with his mechanical designs, and I'm only now starting to dig into his life because I'd like to know more about him as a person. All right, so Henry Robinson Town, who is vaguely related to me, uh, had this great line. Um, few so I know, putting all this text on the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, but I'm going to read it, and it's going to be really exciting. Few self-respecting professional inventors have felt their mission to be fulfilled until they have invented a lock of some kind. Apparently, there is a fascination in the subject which they cannot resist, however complete their ignorance of the past achievements and present developments of the art. And so each incontinently proceeds to invent things which, while new to his untutored mind, are usually already well-known, occasionally in successful use, but more frequently long since consigned to the limbo of useless and discarded schemes. This was how he began on his treatise for how to make locks. <laughs> um, and he's right, everybody was inventing locks in the 1800s. For some reason, everybody's just obsessed with this. Um, so this is a guy that went by the name Dillingham, um, John Dillingham. Uh, he was from Maine. He made some press briefly when he figured out how to grow mulberry trees in the high arid climes of uh, the hills of Maine because Maine had a bounty for silkworms because we were trying to reduce our dependence on foreign silk, which was the big problem well before reducing our dependence on foreign oil. Um, and so there was a bounty on silkworms. This guy figured out, he and a couple of partners figured out how to grow mulberry trees in the higher climes um, of, of Maine, uh, but he also invented a lock. Uh, this is the key. It is in three parts. What he says about this is that even with the key, one might find himself baffled to operate, even with the use of this, its proper key, because his lock was literally so confusing that his goal was bafflement even if you had the key for it. Um, so, <laughs> what's going on is that, so two of these keyholes are actually false, it'll do nothing if you put anything into them. Um, I don't remember the order, but how this goes is that when you lock the lock at the end of your night with the master key, with one end of that key, you insert it, you turn 180 degrees, at which point you can insert it deeper, turn another 180 degrees, at which point covers will go over all of the keyholes. So you then need to reverse that process just to remove the keyholes. Then there are two differentiated bolt mechanisms manipulated by different portions of the key. Um, and this goes on and on and on. I have a long write-up on it um, that I can disseminate at some point in time. Um, but it is one of the most amazingly elaborate locks that I've ever seen a patent for that just goes on endlessly and then just completely fails to explain the unnumbered uh, unused. Uh, you just have to infer that those are completely useless. Um, <laughs> yes. yes, you can. Um, anyway, so uh, so all this is to say is that everybody, even even this guy that was desperately trying to get those silk worms growing, the, the re mulberry, silk worms only eat mulberry leaves. That's the situation there. That's as much as I know about silk. If it doesn't relate to locks, I probably don't know anything about it. Okay. So why? Why was everybody doing this? Um, and there are just endless stories, but I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about more and more of these just hundreds of lock patents that probably never made it into actual production ever. Um, and, I, and, and it's interesting because there was this incredible culture of invention during this period of time. Um, and the locks, locks were this one thing where you weren't just competing against nature, like in figuring out how to get mulberry trees to grow in a place where they're not supposed to grow. Or uh, th there was a huge, like, a huge, like, rush and land rush to create a machine that could head and and cut that could cut and flatten a head onto a nail in a single motion. Um, and when that was solved, people made the equivalent of millions of dollars. They made their fortunes cutting and heading nails because there was a set problem to solve. But in the case of locks, you're not competing against a machine. You're not competing against nature. You're competing against every other clever human being in the world. 
And well, you can create the perfect machine to cut and head a nail, and maybe someday somebody will be able to innovate a little beyond that to make the process easier, cheaper, whatever. In the case of a lock, you are fighting the endless and unattainable battle for perfect security. So the reason the town is so furious in his tirade before he gives his treatise on how to make locks is because he and the other people in his industry that are really good at this are in the midst of a lifelong, if not multi-generational struggle to achieve this unattainable goal. The town, in particular, is one of the last people in the world that was out there saying, listen, you can pick my lock. I just make it better than most other people. You can pick any lock. I just make it better than most other people. Sadly, with his death, the, the Yale literature changed dramatically. The town was a Yale in town, kind of like Yale Jr., etc. Et so, Dillingham had another patent. Dillingham had another patent. Uh, which is now known as 413X. The X means that it is an X patent. When the patent office burned down in 1836, those of you that are patent office fire scholars will know that this was the fire of 1877. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the place burned a lot. <laughs> uh, this one, however, they recovered everything. In 1836, when it burned, it was actually, all of the patents were being stored in a temporary shelter as they built a fireproof patent office. <laughs> And we lost huge swaths of our industrial history. Um, so 4136X was completely unrecovered. We have no information whatsoever on John Dillingham's lock, whatsoever. Uh, maybe it was the one that he would later submit in the 1860s as the lock that we were just looking at. Maybe that was just a reissue of the same. Um, but we don't know what that is. I presently am engaged in a project to restore as much of those unlucky inventors' patents to the patent record. Um, this is. I launched this at uh, um, BCon uh, right after Source Boston uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I have a couple of great volunteers that are helping me out with the project. So it's x.lock.gd, x.lock.gd. Um, this is what it looks like right now. Uh, this is just the bare bones Twitter bootstrap to provide some information. Um, just put up our first early returns describing the function of a lock that had not previously been fully recovered. We had images of it and we had a scan of, a, of the letters patent. We had a single image and the scan of the letters patent that had never been transcribed. Um, so we nearly fully transcribed it. We're able to recover enough information about it that I'm actually building a 3D model of it presently, uh, which will then have 3D printed and so on and so forth. So we're not just, yes. Can you then put that information back in the patent office? So the, uh, we don't, I don't yet know what the patent office Office will accept as canon. I believe that at the very least, direct transcripts of their terrible scans should go back into the patent office and should actually be made publicly available now. There are other situations where I'm finding detailed descriptions of how the locks worked, but not the actual letters patent, and I have no idea if they have any mechanism for disseminating that information along with the patent. So, We'll restore whatever we can to the patent office, but I'm also going to build this out as a project, not just as the call to action that it is now, but also a way to explore not just the mechanical nature of the locks in, that were lost in this fire, but also the lives of the people involved, um, the family histories, everything, and make it explorable. Uh, this is actually why I began learning to code about eight weeks ago. I finally began learning to code fifth time in my life, but it's going really well. Um, so I'm learning Python, I'm really enjoying it, um, and I want to build this out into, like I, I want to have an API for the lost locks of the, of the patent fire. I want people to be able to pull down as much information as possible and, and do as deep a dive as possible. Um, right now we're just collecting information. Um, if you want to help out, there are a ton of ways to do it, x.lock.gd, hit me up. We have a public Zotero page where all of the research as it pours in is publicly available to anybody to pour over if they want to, and then I'll be doing curation after we get through the data dump phase on, on everything else. Okay, so, um, thank you all very much. This has nothing to do with anything, I just think it's really funny. Um, Lock.gd to get to me, x.lock.gd to get to the project, at Shoebox on Twitter. Um, and this is mostly just a fun talk about a bunch of locks that you're never going to hear about anywhere else for the most part. Um, but this is the sort of stuff that I find really fascinating. Um, and hopefully the X-Lock project is going to reveal even more and crazier locks as we go along. So thank you all very much.